I, it was interesting. When Ian asked me to pick a topic for this, um, he asked me to pick a topic for this about, it must have been at least six or seven months ago when he asked me. And I think he got me in one of those moments where it was like 11.30 at night and I was trying to answer about 100 million emails that were up. And I just thought, I'll just do this. And that really gave me second thought to what it really meant to do this topic. Um, but what's interesting is that I'm, I either knew what I was talking about at 11 o'clock at night, which is highly unlikely, or events transpired afterwards that kind of made it a good topic. But um, about 12 months, just over 12 months ago, the Australian Federal Government um, announced a, their first ever cyber security, well, not their first ever, but they announced a cyber security strategy. And what made this cyber security strategy special was that it was funded. So most of us are used to governments announcing stuff. Um, and in fact, that TV show that was on the ABC for a while, you know, remember about the about nation building Australia? It was all about the announceable every week. The minister needed an announceable every week. When they did the announcement of this cyber security strategy, it came with money, which was very unusual because governments don't tend to allocate money to the things they talk about all that often. Uh, not until an election cycle rolls around anyway. So they allocated about $240 million over four years to the topic of cyber security for our country. Um, and I've spent most of the last year, a lot of the last year, I've spent speaking to a lot of the people heavily involved in that project. So one of the guys that I've spent a bit of time talking to is a guy called Craig Davies, who, if you're not into the cyber security scene, you probably won't know of him, but he was the Chief Information Security Officer for Cochlear, and then after he left Cochlear, he was the Chief Information Security Officer for Atlassian. So Atlassian's probably Australia's most, fav most famous startup IT company, big IT company, multi-billion dollar listed company now. Um, and he left Atlassian last year to become the CEO of the Australian, I've got to remember how to say this right because it's one of those ridiculous government department names, but it's the Australian Cyber Security Growth Network. I think, or the Australian Security Growth Network Centre or something like that. But his job is actually to raise the profile of cyber security across Australia and to raise the profile of cyber security companies that are trying to forge a living, you know, selling services and products in this area. So it's a really interesting thing. But I was talking to him the other day and he said, I, was men I mentioned to him that my, I've got a 17 year old son who's in year 12 at the moment. Amongst the subjects he's doing, he's doing, I don't know what they call it. When I was a kid, we used to call it computer science or IT, they've got different names for it now. So it's like computer engineering or whatever it is. But he's doing the computer subjects in Year 12. And he wants to be, he wants to be involved in cyber security. And I was talking to my mate Craig and I said, my son wants to do a cyber security thing. And you know, obviously lots of government money is being funneled into tertiary education facility institutions now to bring this along. And he goes, tell him not to focus on the technical stuff anymore. Technical stuff is gonna get done by machines. Time to focus on human behaviour and behavioural sciences. He said, that's where the money's going to be and that's where the careers are going to be. And that got me, I was sort of thinking about that and that made me kind of reframe some of the things I was going to talk about today. So I picked the title Hacking Humans because I think that's the reality of what people are doing today. The bad guys today don't need to hack computers anymore. Now remember, I think I stood here maybe two or three years ago, possibly in this room even, and said, we're going to get hit. Mac users are going to get hit by some kind of cyber threat in that next year. And the reality is they did. Certain things did happen. There is now Mac ransomware for Mac. There, there have been other incursions against Mac. We had the incident where, um, and this happened in China, where Xcode, a version of Xcode, which is a development toolkit that's used for making Mac, um, app, Mac and um, iOS applications, an infected version of that was made available to developers because they couldn't get their hands on the real version because it was too slow to download in China. So the hackers put one up that was infected and then people used to create real applications that had malicious code embedded in them without even the knowledge of the software developer. Right? So hundreds of thousands of people in China downloaded to their iPhones and iPads infected applications that the developer didn't even know was inf were infected. Now what's interesting there is the applications were infected but what really happened was the process was infected. So it wasn't the software that was the problem, it was the process that was the problem. And the problem with the process was that the people couldn't get what they wanted, so they were attacked through, you know, to use cyber security language, a backdoor. And the backdoor wasn't the computer system, but it was the people and the tools the people used. 
So we've kind of gone into this very different world now where we talk about hacking people rather than hacking systems. So does anyone know what that's a picture of? Yeah. Close. More specific. It's a virus. You know what we care, how much we care about viruses in cybersecurity now? We basically don't. Viruses are a non-issue. Viruses are relatively easy for us to deal with. Computer systems deal with most viruses. If I, if I look at what happens in um, enterprise security, so big business security systems, when a piece of, when someone downloads an email and it arrives, they've got a box, a computer system that sits in the middle, grabs that email, looks inside it, sees the attachment, opens the attachment, checks if it's infected, says yes or no, closes it all back up and then puts it through to your mailbox. And it does that in a split second. And it re, if everyone knows about virtualization, so you create a virtual, virtual computer in a computer, it literally spins up a virtual computer to test this, test the attachment to make sure it's safe or not, and then destroys the virtual machine. So it's not, it's, so the infected, if it's infected, it doesn't survive, it doesn't persist. All happens in a split second. We have ways to deal with most of this kind of junk now. It's very unusual for a virus to get through. Now, people are going to say, but ransomware and wanna cry. We'll talk about those in a minute. They're a little bit, they're a different kettle of fish. So viruses are really a bit of a non-issue. But I just kind of wanted to mention them because we talk about viruses a lot. People talk about Mac antivirus software it was crap, particularly in the 90s and early 2000s. You know, do you ever remember Norton antivirus? Much to their chagrin. Do you ever remember another joke about, you know, on the, on the box of Norton antivirus, there was a guy called Peter Norton who was the creator of that software and he used to sit around on the front of the box like this. You know why he was sitting like this? Because he was waiting for his computer to load up after his software was installed. <laughs> it was appalling. But... It, that, that whole problem with um, viruses is kind of gone now. We're dealing with, with different sorts of threats. Malicious software is real. Right? It's something that affects every computer user in this world. The thing is that the bad guys now are much more organised. Okay? Malicious software or malware is a commodity. I can go with a thousand US dollars, I can take down most people's businesses. Because I can go and buy the bits and pieces I need and rent a botnet of computers, so a, a robot army of computers that have been infected with, so, with someone else's malware, I can actually hire those to distribute a piece of malicious software that I can go and buy from someone else and to distribute it and hit their networks. Or I can rent a botnet to attack, your, attack the login page on your website's business so that it gets so inundated with traffic that it won't work anymore, it gets, it's a denial of service attack. This stuff is just commodity software now. And what makes them better organised than the good guys is that they all work together. They have a marketplace that says, I'm going to go and buy my um, DDoS software from Noel, and I'm going to go to Charmian and rent her botnet, and I'm going to go to, I don't know, to John. Where's John? John sitting there. I'm going to go to John and I'm going to ask John to please assemble a wrapper around the software I got from, from Noel so that it doesn't, doesn't look like anything anyone's ever seen before. So it's, effectively, it's like I buy a letter from you, a piece of paper. I buy an envelope from you that no one knows what the, what's inside that envelope because it's a type of envelope no one's ever seen before. And I buy a post office service from Charmian. I put those bits together and I'm off to the races and I can, I can go and attack another person's business. It's a commoditised market now. So the bad guys know all of this. So that's another bit. Now I want you to kind of hold all these bits in your head because they come together a little bit later on as I'm speaking. But there's a few bits and pieces we need to kind of put together. The other thing that these guys have got, does anyone, um, does anyone have a friend who's been infected by ransomware or know someone who's been infected by ransomware? Yeah. Yeah. What's the matter? No, it wasn't on a Mac, but that's like, you know how, when you get infected with ransomware, the bad guys just want money. It's purely a financial transaction for them. And they're not going to not fix your machine after they take your money. They will actually give you the decryption key after they've taken your money. Because they want to make sure they've got a good reputation, in a perverse sort of way, for fixing the problem they gave you so that they can keep getting paid by other people in future. The way they get paid is with um, Bitcoin. So it's a cryptocurrency. So it's not physical money, but it's an electronic transaction effectively that takes place. A lot of people don't know how to use Bitcoin or access Bitcoin. They've got help desks. Because part of what I can go and buy from the commodity market is a help desk to help the people that are infected work out how to pay the ransom. 
It's, it's, this is a, an entire production line of criminality. Um, these guys make the mafia look like amateurs. Seriously. And I'm half Sicilian, I know. <laughs> well, yeah. So a couple of little bits of data just to kind of back up how sophisticated some of this stuff actually is. Uh, there's a calendar up there. You can see what day I actually did this calendar. I pulled it out on the 14th of June. It's not for me. So on the 14th of June, I put this up. If your computer got infected with a piece of malicious software on the 1st of January, does anyone want to have a crack at when you would probably find out about it on average? 14th of June? No. Let's just go for the number of months. Who wants to have a crack at how many months it might take? I'm going to give you a hint, it's more than one. It takes more than a month to get to, on average for businesses to find out they've been infected with malicious software. And so by this time it's spread. Well, I'll give you, it's less than a year. Eight months. That's the average time it takes for businesses to find out they've been infected. Does anyone want to have a crack at I mean, Two thirds of the businesses find out in one particular way. Does anyone want to have a guess at what that is? Jesus. No. That's not how they find out. Two thirds of people find out when someone else tells them. Either a customer or the cops knock on the door and say, your computers have been infected. And when they go back and do the analysis of when it started, it was eight months ago. So, did everyone hear about the Sony hack a couple of years ago? Where um, allegedly the, the bad Korean government broke into Sony's computer network and for a, um, it was all over a movie that they made where they you know, suggested that the North Korean president might have been blown up and they didn't like that. Um, that hack, the bad guys were in their systems for over six months before they actually executed the attack. The bad guys, everyone's heard about the target thing in 2013, November 2013 where credit card numbers were stolen out of their point of sale systems. The bad guys were in for about nine months. And they didn't find out about it until the bad stuff happened. So these things, these guys are smart. They just sit there and wait, and they wait for that moment. It's like a thief breaks into your house and says, I'm not going to knock off the watch. I'm going to wait till you leave the keys to the BMW in the open, then I'll take them. And I'm just going to sit there in the corner and hide for nine months. This is what these guys do. Bureau of Meteorology, how long did they take? Um, that one's always hard to tell because um, they may not really know. <laughs> um, and by the way, Bureau of Meteorology went public because it was going to be, they were going to be out of, in the media. They're not the only government department that's had a significant breach. Um, but most of them won't talk. No, well, the census was out in the open. Census, don't get me started on the census. The census was, um, what's the best word? You know, um, it's basically a cascade of stupidity <laughs> um, is what happened at the census. And the ATO was not a dissimilar thing at the end of last year as well with all the stuff that went down with, that then had knock-on on Centrelink and other systems. Um, so bad guys stay in systems for about eight months. The thing that I find really, really frustratingly stupid about this is that these guys use known vulnerabilities in systems. So you know when you patch your system, you know, you get a Mac update or an iOS update and you do that? 99% of those things that sit inside your network for nine, sit inside people's networks for nine months, are things that were fixed a year ago or more. So this is, the bad guys get in because people don't fix stuff that's broken. This is the equivalent of complaining when you get burgled when you leave the front door open or you have a broken window and you leave it there or your burglar alarm doesn't work and you don't fix it. This is what it is. And that, that to me is a pretty damning piece of information. And you start putting this stuff together and you go, Everyone hears the news stories. Bad guys execute some kind of malware attack, most sophisticated attack we've ever seen. Um, sophisticated attack is often code for stupid company. Let themselves get hit. And it's sad to say, but it's, it's the truth. Now, having said that, some of the stuff is actually pretty clever, and I'm going to talk about some of the clever stuff that bad guys do um, that are really an extension of things that we already see today. So just really quickly, I've talked about this stuff before, but we really, it's important to understand what bad guys want. And the bad guys are only ever interested in four different things. 
The first one is that money. This is where ran this is why ransomware is such a prevalent attack today. It's because it's money. These guys can make 500 bucks a pop by infecting a machine, collect the money, give you the decryption key, you fix your problem and you get out and you're done. It's actually a more seamless transaction than an Apple store buy sometimes. <laughs> um, but that's what they're in. They're in it for the money. Um, the other one that's interesting is denial of service attacks. So a denial of service attack is when your computer system gets inundated with a whole bunch of traffic to the point where it becomes non-functional. So I often think it's like going to get a drink from a drinking fountain and someone sticks a fire hose in your mouth. That's kind of what a denial of service attack does. It just floods you with more than you can manage in terms of network traffic. DDoS attacks, denial of, distributed denial of service attacks, often launched as a form of extortion. Illegal gambling sites do this to each other in order to stop each other from taking bets. So my betting agency wants to make sure it makes more money. So it goes off and it says, I'm going to go to your betting agency and flood it with so much traffic that the punters can't go to you, they have to come to me. So they launch attacks against each other for commercial gain. And sometimes they do it just because they want to be mean. Um, the other one is power. Some hackers just do this because they want to be able to say to you, I got you. You know, this to me, these are the almost, this is actually a shrinking group. But this to me was what um, the script kiddies were about. It was just about being able to say, yeah, 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 I gotcha. But it is a bit of a power thing of, I can get into your system, there's nothing you can do to stop me. But the, the one way you can guarantee that your computer systems will be hacked is to say your computer systems can't be hacked. Because that's red rag to a bull to some of these guys. Um, Influence. They want to just do things to change outcomes. The, the Sony hack was really a hack about influence. It was to stop Sony from releasing a movie. That's what it ultimately came down to. That's the North Korean government wanted Sony to not release a particular movie that was going to show them in a bad light. Of course, Sony's answer was, we're just going to release it for free now. Uh, but it hurt Sony because they lost commercial gain and they also had a massive loss of reputation and it didn't help that it was Sony's I'm trying to remember if it was the second or third major hack they'd had in 18 months. Because um, they'd had their PlayStation network breached so that credit card numbers of people were stolen. So all of a sudden, you know, 100 million Americans had to go and get new credit cards for about the fifth time in, five, in three or four years after major attacks. Uh, but sometimes it's just influence. They want to, someone will attack someone else in order to change their behaviour about something. This is what tends to happen at, in corporate level, at a corporate level. And the last one is the one that I don't think we really, all, any of us really have to worry about individually in this room, but it's, an interest, it's one of the most interesting ones, is nation-state attacks, where one country attacks another country. These are the really fascinating ones because these are the ones that actually make a material difference to our world, but we don't have, as individuals, we don't have a huge amount of um, influence over. So I spoke to, uh, about 18 months ago, I spoke to a guy who was the Chief Information Security Officer for the US government during George Bush's presidency. And he had some really interesting stories to tell. But one of the things that he said to me and that he uh, they had data for but they could never share in the big public domain was that they knew that the Chinese economy had, had been advanced by 20 years, been given a 20-year leapfrog through the theft of intellectual property from American companies. So we know that companies steal stuff from each other. That's been going on ever since, you know, Pyramid Maker A and Pyramid Maker B went into business across the road from each other. But this is a 20-year leapfrog for, a bloke, for a, a, one of the top 10 economies in the world because they stole intellectual property from another country. Um, and I think Boeing was one of the companies that suffered in that, but there have been others. And they're, they're not always companies you hear about because some of them are... You know, they're quite small inventions when they're stolen, but they become very big pieces of other puzzles later on. But it's, a, it's, it's really interesting when you start to talk about things like that. And, of course, we now know what happens when one government decides they'd like a particular person in power in another country and their ability to manipulate election results. Um, now, whether the... My personal opinion... I, not a political statement. My personal opinion is that it's very clear that Russia influenced the result of the United States election last November. And certainly the Americans have got very strong evidence for that. Um, but what's interesting in that is they didn't access anyone's voting machine. 
they access people's opinions. They hack the people. Yeah. And that's the really interesting part of that. They hack the humans. Now, I, one of my mates um, is a guy called Dr. Hugh Thompson. Um, and he made his, um, his big claim to fame when he started his career in cyber security was he was on a TV special for PBS in the United States. And he hacked voting machines that were being used in um, state and federal elections in the United States. And he did it for a TV show. Um, so it was an ethical hack done for TV. Um, to show that it could be done. He was actually trying to point out the vulnerability in the machines because the US government refused to believe that their machines were ever vulnerable. Um, but it's interesting because you don't have to hack the voting machines. Even though apparently that was in the plans for the Russians last November, but they got stopped from doing it. Um, but they, you don't have to hack voting machines, you just have to hack voters. You have to alter human behaviour. And that's where it gets really interesting because some of this stuff has really got more to do with human behaviour than anything else. So kind of just to summarise a few bits and pieces that we've gone through in that. Basically, attackers are either very highly skilled or not very highly skilled. It's like anyone. You go into any workplace and there's people who've got a very high level of skill in a particular discipline, people who've got a lower level of skill in another discipline. And then you've got people who are very focused on what they're doing and people who are just going shotgun and trying to hit as much stuff as they possibly can. Opportunists are just like the people who walk past your car and see an open car window and go, I'll grab the money, or I'll grab the purse, or I'll grab the whatever through the open window. They haven't got any focus, they just go for whatever's floating past. And they don't have a lot of skill because they just go for what's easy. Those guys, you kind of, if you take very basic precautions around your computer and around your own behaviour using your computer, which is more important, I think, those guys are probably not going to be a big factor in your life. Low level of skill but highly focused are things like spear phishing. So does anyone know what a phishing attack is? Who doesn't know what phishing is? Okay, so phishing is when you, you know when you get an email that looks like it's from a bank but it's not from a bank? That's a phishing attack. So it looks like a real email but it, it directs you to a website that looks like a real website but isn't the real McCoy. And what it's trying to do is to get you to log in so that they can steal your login credentials. So I saw a dem demonstration of this last week. Um, uh, a mate of mine, Ty Miller, who's a penet he's a penet they call them penetration testers now, but really what they are are people that used to do bad things but now do them do them for the good team. Um, so it's like when someone used to play for Collingwood but transfers to Hawthorne. <laughs> um, so he's a penetration tester. He created, and I watched him do, I, no word of a lie, I'm st I sat this far away from him and I watched him take another company's website, clone it, create an email that looked like it was the real thing, sent it to someone and had a login page so that he could just steal their login. And he did this in about three minutes. Literally three minutes. He was able to copy an entire corporate website with the login, get someone to go to it, put in their name and password, collect that piece of information and, have, and basically own their user account in minutes. It's trivially easy for bad guys to do this stuff now. So they don't need a whole lot of skill. They just want to know who their targets are. So they've got some focus. They'll typically go in a spear phishing attack. It'll be very targeted. They'll go, I want John because he's the CEO of a company. A phishing attack is the same thing when he goes, I'll go for everyone and see who I get. So spear phishing, one person or two, you know, a very small number of people. Phishing is attack the whole company. Rob. I work quite work from multinational. Um, the IT department did a test and put out um, yep. one of those emails to see who would do it. Yep. And if you pressed on it and it came up and saying you failed the test, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. The top three levels were all the worst. The bottom people either didn't read the emails or knew better. Yeah. And, and that's not an atypical it was result. All the top levels of management who failed. Yeah. If you work in a large company, there's actually an organisation called Fishme, P-H-I-S-H-M-E, <coughs> who do this as a service, do the testing for you. Yeah, for corporates. Yeah, yeah for corporates. Um, so spear phishing is highly focused. Normal phishing is less focused, but it's still got some skill attached to it because you've still got to be able to craft something that is good enough to fool people. They're engineering something that's going to hack the human behaviour. Um, denial of service attacks, again, you don't need a lot of skill. You just need to know who you want to hit because you can go and buy all the tools from the marketplace. 
Okay, I've told, said to you before, it is literally like walking through a west field and going, I'll have one of them, one of them, one of them, and I'll assemble an attack. It's like Lego. Um, and educated guessing is still a thing. Um, I know that there's a login page here, and I know that Anthony logs into that page. Everyone's email addresses tend to be first name dot last name at company name dot com dot au. Um, I know he's got some kids and a dog, and I know his birthday because they've find, they've got stole that information from us somewhere else. Let's start guessing some passwords and see how we go. And they do it, and sometimes they get there. Nation state attacks, like I said, I don't think anyone here is going to be attacked by China, um, but they are high, they're very highly skilled and highly focused attacks. The first really big one. Um, first really big nation state attack was the, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, was the um, Stuxnet. Stuxnet, sorry, that's right, Stuxnet, which attacked centrifuges in Iran's nuclear reactor um, capability. That started with, I mean, people kind of go, that was pretty simple, you know, some, some fool picked up a USB stick that was infected with a virus and plugged it into a computer and after the races. It was actually far more complicated than that. It actually required the exploitation of four different vulnerabilities. The changes that were made to the centrifuges to cause them to overheat were imperceptible unless you put your ear to the centrifuge and could hear the difference in the spin rates. Um, because they didn't stop them and they didn't speed them up to a ridiculous speed. They just changed them enough so that over time there would be a cumulative effect. It was actually a very sophisticated attack took a lot of focus, a lot of skill, and you know the other thing I don't have on here, but if I had another axis to make it a 3D graph, would be determination. You know, you've really got to want it. Um, so it kind of gives you a bit of a lie. If you think now, you know what they're after, you know what kinds of targets they're at, it gives you a pretty good lie of the land of what's going on in hacker land today. Um, and what you've noticed is I haven't said they're exploiting Adobe Flash, or they're exploiting a problem with Windows, or they're exploiting a problem with Mac OS, or iOS, or Android. It's almost always focusing on something a human's going to do. Because they know computer systems are much stronger today than they ever have been. So they're after the weak link in the chain. And the weak link in the chain is almost always one of us. We're the weakness. So I want to talk a little bit about one specific type of attack. Okay. Now, this is one that could potentially hit anyone in this room. Okay. Um, and I'm, only, I'm using this as an illustration of the kind of things these guys do to hack humans. So I'm, talking, I'm going to talk about a thing called a business email compromise attack. So it's either a BEC attack, sometimes called, or email fraud. So the typical scenario is that they, they'll go after a person who has access to financial delegation in, an, in, an organ, in a company. So someone who can sign a cheque or transfer or authorise a, a bank transfer, or something like that. Right? So it, this is, you know, I think, you know, Noel's a, law, Noel, Noel's a lawyer. Fraud's as old as the hills. People have always tried to, you know, can I use the word bullshit? I'm going to anyway. Bullshit people into doing things no matter what. We've always tried to lie to them to get them to do stuff. This is actually really interesting because what they'll do is they will investigate a specific person. So these guys will actually carry out their own surveillance on a person. So they'll sit there and go, we know this person's um, married, two kids, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you're a smart CEO, you don't put your travel plans on LinkedIn or Facebook and stuff like that, right? Everyone agrees? You don't, you don't start doing that if you're a person of some, with some influence. How many CEOs tell their wives not to post on Facebook? How many of them get away with telling their wives not to post on Facebook or their, or their husbands? These bad guys will work out who you're related to and look at them to work out what you're doing. So when you know someone's partner says, oh, so-and-so is going away for three weeks, it's a pain in the bum because I've got to run the kids to school on my own or you know they're going to miss this re re recital or this football game or whatever it is, the hackers go, right, we now have a time when this person's about to catch a plane. That's important. They know the person's not going to be around. If I go on the company website, Company websites are really, really handy because they tell you things like who's the boss and who reports to them. And there'll be things in corporate news that say there's a merger going on or they're trying to acquire someone or they're in the middle of you know, a, a public, um, public offering on the share market. Lots of useful information. Then the bad guys will go, well, let's put something together. And they'll back this up 
in a moment. I'll tell you how they back this up. They'll go, look, we want to go to anthony.com. And I'll go, well, anthony.com's already taken because that's my company name. So they'll go and register Anthony, but instead of an O in it, they'll use a zero. So it looks real, but isn't. And they'll start sending emails from what looks like really anthony.com that look like they're coming from the CEO about 10 minutes before the plane's about to take off. And it will say something like, Dear Chief Financial Officer, I'm about to catch a plane, so you won't be able to call me or contact me, but can you please make sure you transfer $150,000 from the corporate account to supplier X Here's the attached invoice. It's really urgent. We need it for the acquisition. Send. Last year, that fraud made $3 billion, according to the FBI, hitting a number of different companies around the world. $3 billion to different companies. Right? Did they hack a computer system? They just pick the weak spots. They knew when people, because what they do is they'll, they'll play on your emotions. CEO's about to get on a plane. If I don't do it, you'll kill me. Um, it's, they, they create an artificial stress around the timing. They make it look real. But really the only hack that they kind of did was registered a domain that looked a bit like the original domain. Um, which is interesting, because that sprouted a whole new business for people who then go, oh, your company's anthony.com. Here are the 500 domains that could look like that. We'll register them for you as a service and hand them over to you. So there's actually companies now that do this for you. So if you want robertcharlton.com and you go, oh, hang on a sec, what are all the different variations of that? They'll figure it out and buy them all for you and package them up and sell them to you. It's a business. Um, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. You buy them every year. Yeah, you pay the renewals and all that sort of stuff. But then you sit there and go, what's the cost of me getting breached or having $100,000 stolen? And the other thing is that this started as a very high-end corporate scam. And within a year, it became a small business problem. Now, how many of you run, a, have run or are running, have run a small business? How much would $10,000 hurt if you lost it in an afternoon? I know plenty of businesses that would just say, see you later, I'm done. They'd close up. They would. They just would not be able to trade another day if they lost ten grand out of the account that afternoon. That's what these guys do. Um, and what's interesting is if you go to the bank and say to the bank, "This happened to me," they'll say, "Sorry, that was a legitimate transfer. You made. You consent. You consented to handing that money over. This wasn't like someone skimmed your credit card. This is you entered the pin number. Um, and cyber insurers." Uh, interesting with this one, if you get into the cyber insurance thing, some will protect you from it and some won't. It'll depend on what precautions you've got in place. Um, but it's really interesting because again, it's playing on the psychology of the person. It's you get past the first little thing, which is get the email into their inbox so they read it. But after that, it plays on social media information, fake, false urgency of a situation, and it also plays with the Australian culture of not questioning the boss. Because how many people would go, hang on, the CEO's lost his marbles. I'm not doing what he says. Most people would be fearful of doing that. Not every person, but a lot of people would be fearful of doing that. Um, so they play on that entire culture as well. So I think that's, a, that's interesting. Because you sit there and go, bad guys, bad guys. If you look at my chart before about focus, it's a highly focused, highly skilled attack. And in fact, what they'll do is often they'll back this up with an extra step because CFO's not a deal. He may go, he's not going to be on the phone, he's not going to be on that plane for another five minutes, or it's not going to take off. I'm going to pick up the phone and make a phone call. These guys will have a phone number in the email signature that's theirs. And they'll have someone sitting on the other end of the phone to take the call. So that when the guy go, rings up and goes, hey CEO. Because people don't remember everyone's phone numbers anymore. He looks on the email, rings that number. Hi, CEO. Are you sure you want me to transfer that 100000 or a million dollars or whatever? And the guy on there goes, I'm about to get on the plane. Can you just get it done? And they do it. And people have been scammed that way. If, does anyone want to have a crack at what's, um, how big a problem, um, what the financial impact of cybercrime is globally now? 
Anyone have any idea of how much money cybercrime is worth globally now? It's worth more than the international drug trade. Huh? It's worth well over half a trillion dollars now. Huh? People make more money from this than they do from trading cocaine. Now, I was reading the other day about... I'm telling you, um, Escobar was the big drug lord in South America. I was reading a thing the other day that when he was on the run, he burned $3 million in, in fresh cash to keep his family warm <laughs> because he figured he was making 25 or 30 million bucks a week anyway. Right? That's the kind of level of money we're talking about here. And we're talking about people that are almost undetectable and impossible to get. The last time I looked, there was not a really good extradition agreement between Australia and Russia or Australia and China. Um, so these guys hide behind um, international lines, play on our emotions. So they're ungettable, they're smart, they target it, and they work out where they're going to make their money. Because most of this is about money, ultimately. Um, Risk comparisons? Between... Between you know, drugs and cyber. Oh, and cyber. The risk is minimal. Yeah. The chance of getting caught is so small in relative terms. Um, I spoke to a guy the other day, um, Sammy, I'm trying to remember his surname, Kankar or something like that. When he was a kid, he broke MySpace. Does anyone remember MySpace when MySpace was a thing? He accident, well, Sammy accidentally hacked MySpace. Um, so he created a worm on MySpace that every time someone visited his page, would automatically add them as a friend. But that wasn't getting him enough new friends. So he made it so that whenever someone visited him, it added them as a friend, but then added the same piece of code to their page so that everyone who visited them also became Sammy's friend. Anyway, at 3,000 friends an hour, he started to get a bit concerned that people might notice. <laughs> uh, so he wrote a bit of code that took him off everyone's thing so it would stop. However, he made a small mistake, and what it did is it erased everyone's MySpace page. So one afternoon, MySpace disappeared, um, which was a bit unfortunate for you know teenagers all over the world, I guess. Um, but that worm propagated. He didn't make a buck out of that. It was a different thought. That was the 90s or you know early 2000s. He didn't make any money out of it. Um, it took six months before anyone knocked on his door, and eventually he said it was quite funny. He had um, federal police, FBI, state police, the local sheriff, and I'm trying to remember who the other one was, but it was some like it's almost like the local parking official showed up at his doorstep. He said it was it was like a who's who of law enforcement from every level in his home state, and he eventually was prosecuted, um, and he had to do he was on probation for three years where he wasn't allowed to use a computer, which was interesting because by that stage he actually owned a computer company, um, so he used to do a lot of standing over people's shoulders. He said. Um, and he did uh, 72 days of picking up rubbish on the side of the road. But he said he learned his lesson. He's actually a really interesting guy to talk to now. But, you know, again, he said that play, it was, it was a whole human thing of wanting to get more friends, and that kind of just went a bit silly afterwards. So, anyway, there we go. I just want to talk about this one, this guy, before we move on, because I actually want to give you some strategies for dealing with all this junk. Okay? So, does anyone know who this guy is? Les might know if he sees, sees him by face. He's a journalist from Wired magazine. Is that not Crinton, is it? No, it's Matt Honan. No. So, Matt Honan is a, German, is a journalist for Wired. I, I think I'll go with a was for that one. I don't think he's with them anymore, with Wired magazine in the US. Matt's famous because he got hacked and his entire digital life was destroyed. Everything. Photos social media, you know, everything that he had about himself on, that existed online disappeared. One piece of information was all the bad guys needed to do this to him. One piece of information. Does anyone want to have a crack at what that one piece of information might have been? Was that the third time? No. 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 First number? No, that's close. You're getting closer though. It is a number. So it's a number. No. Telephone number? No. Okay, I'll keep you in the The last, the last four digits of his credit card number. The last four digits of his credit card number were what the hackers used to attack him. Because they took those last four digits, 
went to app, rang Apple support and said, hi, I'm Matt, I've lost my password, can you reset my account? And they've said, oh, no, you have to verify your identity. What were the last four digits of your credit card number? And they said, one, two, three, four, they reset that account password with the account password the bad guy told them to put on. Yeah, that's been happening Then they logged into his iCloud account, looked through his emails and found all that password reset stuff that you need for all of his other social media accounts and his bank and his everything else. And they systematically went through everything from those first four digits. Okay? And they wiped everything. He lost his entire digital identity. Which for someone who's, if you're like me, and your, 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 your CV or your resume is effectively a living online presence, it's actually quite devastating. And the fact that he, you know, there were photos and stuff like that which only existed online because that's where they were. So that was, that's a, an interesting thing. But it, what I wanted to highlight out of that wasn't the fact, it was we actually give away a lot of information really, really easily to people. Like the last four digits of your credit card number, less likely. Um, my bank, whenever they ring me, ask me to verify my identity. Hi, uh, is that Mr. Caruana? Yes, could you tell us your date of birth? How many people say, how many people give that up? No, I... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I say, I've got to review first, or I'll read the bank. Yeah, well, I've discovered some banks get really, really stroppy when you say things like, I'll only tell you if you prove to me who you are. <laughs> I, and that's why I'm, I'm down that road now. I don't give them anything. Give them nothing. No one, no one should ring you up. You should never give them information. Well, I found lately that people want to know um, other information in addition to the, you know, the first day. Yeah, give them nothing. They want the three or four things. Not give them nothing. Thing. Give them nothing. You know what you say? Where are you from? Mm. Is the only question I ask them. And if they say, you know, NAB or. Centrelink or whatever it is that they answer, go right. I'll look up your number now online and I will call you back. What reference number should I use to follow this up? That's that's your answer. That should be your stock answer. Give them nothing. You can. You, there is no way to verify who's on the other end of the phone. I. Does everyone know who Kevin Mitnick is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Some people. Kevin Mitnick did. I'm trying to remember how many years it was. He did in federal prison in the U.S. for hacking a whole bunch of stuff, including a whole bunch of federal government departments. Um, it, was, it was kind of sport back then. It was the 90s, early 2000s. People did this stuff just for fun. Anyway, he got caught, went to jail. He actually ended up in solitary. In solitary, sorry, solitary is what people who get play, use Windows get into. Mm -hmm. um, he got, ended up in solitary and was banned from using a telephone while he was in jail because a police officer convinced the judge that he could launch nuclear missiles by whistling into a telephone. <laughs> It's the, it's the funniest thing I ever heard. But I stood next to Kevin last year, and he was doing a, he was doing some live hacking on stage, and I was emceeing his event, and I was talking to him about it. It's it just a scream. But he says, I you know, believe that. well, I that, worked in IC Technologies a while ago, and there was a kid who was known to the group who could put his head to the socket on the wall hmm. and tell you what number it was that you were dialing. Yeah, that's a gift. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that kid? I know who it was. Yeah. Yeah. Worked for my teacher. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this, you know, guys like this, they don't need a whole lot of information to figure out how to break things. I stood next to Kevin and he, he asked me for one piece of information. He asked me for my partner's phone number. Right? My partner's phone number. He texted her from an online service a message saying, can you please transfer the money into the joint into this account? It's our joint account. That was his message. So he gave her an account number and said, it's the joint account. When she received that text message, she thought it was from me. And I was standing, I was standing a metre away from him when he did this. Okay? All he needed was her number and the fact that he knew my name. And he put that together, he searched my name, found my phone number online, he created a message that looked like it was from me, and sent it to her with a, can you transfer the money over to the joint account in case you forget the account number, here it is. It was the easiest thing in the world. It's for you. That's all right. So, 
I've kind of painted it. My aim in this was to kind of paint a bit of a doom and gloom. Well, not really a doom and gloom, but really just give you an idea of the kind of stuff that people are doing in the world. And traditionally, these guys are just hacking on human behaviour. They're looking for things that we do either out of convenience or because we're duped into doing them and they're attacking those behaviours. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day who... Has anyone, anyone heard? There's this device you can get called a rubber ducky. Okay? Yeah, it doesn't actually look like a rubber ducky. It's a USB stick. It looks like a normal USB memory stick. But... When you plug it into a computer, it doesn't matter whether it's a Mac or a PC or something running Linux or whatever, when it plugs in, the computer thinks it's a keyboard. Right? Computers have got this thing called the human interface, HID, you know, human interface device profile. Right? When you plug a USB, when a, when a computer plug, a, a keyboard gets plugged into the computer, the computer says, hey, it's a keyboard, let's go. You can type stuff in. He's made these USB sticks that computers think are keyboards. And then he loads them with a whole bunch of commands that automatically execute. <laughs> so when you plug one of these suckers in, it can launch 32,000 characters a second of commands. Right? So it'll plug into your Mac, launch a terminal, and start bunging in commands like crazy. Or a Windows machine, go to a command prompt or a PowerShell and do the same, or do the same with a Linux terminal. Right? He demonstrated how he, did, he was asked to do a white hat, uh, an ethical hack for a bank. A bank asked him to, to prove how secure they were. Because the way bank, he said, whenever a bank comes to him, they always go, oh, the auditors are giving us a hard time. We need you to come and do a, can do a pen test so we can prove to them that we're OK. So anyway, 15 seconds later, he transferred $15 million out of a bank account by walking into a bank branch, seeing an unlocked computer on a thing, plugging the USB stick in for a few seconds and taking it out. That was the entire effort. It was like in, out, walked out, 15 million. Right? Now, obviously, he's done some research and reconnaissance before to know what to type into the computer to make that happen. But once he did that recon, it only took seconds. Interestingly, he dumped 100 of these rubber ducky devices at the RSA conference in San Francisco this year. So RSA conference gets about 45,000 security professionals together in one place. He dumped 100 of these in different places um, and they got 60 of them were plugged in. <laughs> and all they actually did was, he was nice, he didn't do anything terribly mean. The commands they executed were actually directed them onto a web page that gave them instructions on how to use USB sticks safely. <laughs> um, but he had 60 from 25 different countries got plugged in. Um, never pick up a USB stick and plug it into your computer. Never. So, all right. The, the good news is that security is a big deal and people have finally woken up to it in the corporate world. The corporate world actually realises this is a real risk. The, this became a real risk for companies in the world when they realised they were going to lose money. When the FBI says business email compromise made $3 billion and that um, cybercrime is worth more than the illegal drug trade, finally people woke up. Um, the biggest problem we've got in cyber, and this is just a by the by, is that Somewhere along the line, we decided IT people were the best people to solve the cybercrime problem, um, which to me is a bit like asking your local pharmacist to look after the drug trade. It, the different skill sets. Um, you need different sorts of people. But anyway, um, Microsoft gets a really hard time about security, and sometimes it's justified. Um, but you know, about 15 years ago, Bill Gates sent a memo around to the entire organisation at Microsoft and he initiated a thing called the Trustworthy Computing Initiative. Um, and it actually did change that organisation quite significantly. He effectively said, we are stopping all new development. And they actually stopped everything. They stopped making everything new. And they said, go back and fix everything. And they went back and started fixing stuff. And they took, it took them a long time to do it, and it persists today. But they are, they are a more secure computer company than they were before. And it doesn't mean that they're perfect, but I don't think there's any software out there that's perfect. Um, I don't think that you know, perfect is the enemy of done and that is especially true in software. If they tried to ship perfectly safe, 100% perfect software every time, we'd never get anything new ever. Um, so there, there is that attitude. The bad guys know that most software is better than it ever has been before. The thing that worries me the most is we used to do a lot of stuff with hardware. You know, you wanted to, you wanted to do something, you'd buy a, a piece of, you'd, get, you'd have to go and buy a hardware appliance to do that job. Now what's happening is that increasingly we're just using generic hardware 
and we're using more complex software to do the job that hardware used to do. So an example of that is our operating systems do more and more things that we used to do in firmware and it used to be done with specific hardware. So you used to buy a router. Now, routers are really just computers with multiple network cards in them. They're not that much different to what they used to, to a standard computer now. Most NAS devices, network attached storage devices, are just computers with multiple bays for hard drives. They used to be bespoke, specifically made devices. Now they're just computers with lots of hard drives in them. So increasingly we're throwing the pressure onto software. And the problem with software is people release it quickly because they know they can fix it later. In the old days, you wouldn't do that with hardware because the cost of fixing the hardware afterwards was too high. So I think we've got into a cycle where some stuff comes out prematurely, um, but in general we also build software in a better way than what we used to. So there's a bit of to and fro in that. I think things like app stores are a good thing. Um, Apple started it with the iOS app store and they've tried to extend it with the Mac app store, but they've with less success. When Microsoft is starting to do it now, the next there's a new version of Windows 10 called Windows 10 S, and it will only run applications that come out of the Windows Store. It won't run downloaded software or stuff off a CD. I don't know if anyone uses a CD or a DVD anymore. Um, but it'll only run stuff that comes directly out of the, out of their store. So it only comes out of their curated store, and it's got to fulfil a whole bunch of extra security stuff around it, and like it, can, it has to work in like effectively a sandboxed environment. So it doesn't. It can't receive or send data to external applications and things. So we're getting better at stuff like that. Um, so that's good. I think in general, the people that make our software are getting smarter and make our computer systems are getting better at it. But I think there are things that we need to do. So remember before I had that, the pie chart and I said 99% of the things that happen, are thing, bad things are using vulnerabilities that are a year or more older? Patch your computer system. When Apple release or releases a new version of iOS or a new version of Mac OS or OS X, OS X, install it. It's a pain in the bum, but do it. Because they fix security stuff in there all the time. Now that security stuff may never bother you, but you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what the bad guys are out there doing. Because these bad guys are out there stockpiling vulnerabilities and what they do is they wait till there are two or three that they can hang together to make into an attack package and then they'll rely on people not having updated their systems to attack them. So patch your systems, lots of patches. Patch your operating systems, patch your software. You know, when a, when a new version of Adobe whatever or Pages or Microsoft Word or whatever comes out, patch it. It's a pain. I know it's fine. often, you know, I did the um, iOS 11 update this morning uh, on that iPad. <coughs> 1.75 gigs. It's, it's a necessary evil. You just got to do this stuff. You need the patch. <coughs> um, wi Fi. How many of you trust Wi Fi? Free Wi Fi. Yeah. Or just Wi Fi. Free Wi Fi for a start. Don't trust it. It is trivially easy to create a rogue access point to fool people into connecting. It was a really good thing for about three months when Maccas opened up free Wi-Fi at every, at every restaurant. It was really useful. Until bad guys started to sit in there with their own access point called Maccas free Wi-Fi and hope that people would connect to them instead of the official Maccas one. And they look like they're the real McCoy. They have the login page and the, the warning about don't do evil, don't look at kitty porn, you know, whatever it is when you're in the restaurant, all that kind of stuff. They have all that stuff there. And what happens is while you're doing it, using it, they're capturing everything that you do on the way through. They're basically sitting there like in surveillance mode and they're collecting everything that you type and receive. And if you type in a username and password for your internet banking, I hope you've got more than one account with money in it. You're going to ask me something? You know, I find it really sick when you're in the Apple store in high soils. Yep. It always picks up the Samsung yeah. Wi-Fi. Yeah, because it's nearby. And I've told it to, you know, ignore, ignore it. this network and everything, but whenever you get... The yeah, <laughs> and I won't, connect to, I won't connect to any open Wi-Fi ever. I won't, even, I won't connect to Apple's. And Apple's is super convenient because, if you, like, I travel a lot. I can walk through a shopping mall and as long as there's an Apple store there, I know I'm going to get a connection. Um, but I've given up on using it. I won't, I won't touch it. Um, I just 
my trust level is very, very low. If I'm using anyone else's Wi-Fi, I use it with a VPN. Um, and that means if I was using, if there was, I don't know if there's Wi-Fi on, has my got its Wi-Fi on it, Les? Yeah, if that was on, I wouldn't use it without a VPN. You're all nice people, but I don't trust anyone. Because um, it's not even about your Wi-Fi point being hacked. It's the fact that there are also there are always there are flaws inside the so inside um, the communications network, the communications software as well. About three years ago, does anyone remember a thing called Heartbleed? So Heartbleed was a fault in the net, in the communications protocols that could be exploited by bad guys to steal data. Now you could have had a perfectly secure network, but if someone knew how to, knew how to exploit the Heartbleed flaw, you were cooked. So. I don't trust anyone. So, so if you're if you're traveling anyway, I'll use um, you know, where I'm staying. I'll use their Wi-Fi because I'm. Do you have a VPN? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. You're very trusting. You are so far, far more trusting you than me. You don't have a VPN at all. VPN everywhere. I don't trust anything. You just can't. It's the thing is that they might have all the best intentions in the world, Ooh. but hotels don't run computer networks for a living, so they're not really good at it anyway. And the performance tells you they're not very good at it usually. Um, but how do you know you're connecting to the hotel and not the guy in the room next door with an access point that's got the same name? Yeah, well, that's right. That's why I asked you the question. Yeah, you don't know. You just you don't know. Um, so I think Wi-Fi, don't connect to anyone else's Wi-Fi if you have to. Cause, and I accept that some, there are times when it's, there is a need to and it's convenient, always with a VPN. So at least you know that everything going in and out of your computer is encrypted and no one can read it. So even if they steal the data, someone, even if it's a rogue access point that's collecting the data, they can't do anything with it because it's encrypted. Um, how do you get onto a VPN? You pay money. You buy it. You buy a service. Don't use free VPNs. Right? You know the old saying that if, you, if, if something is free, you're the product? Yes. Free VPN, soft, free VPN services are probably using your data and on selling it somewhere. So pay for a VPN. You can get good VPN services for less than 50 Australian dollars a year. Um, it's interesting, I'll segue slightly. Um, an Australian company created, has set up a new VPN solution that they released earlier this year called Wangle. What makes Wangle really interesting is the Wangle VPN solution They've, deemed, they've taken legal advice that says that they're subject to the data retention laws that the telcos are subject to. So Wangle is actually collecting your browser, that, what were you're browsing to, and holding it for two years in case they're subpoenaed by the federal court or by federal law enforcement. Because they've deemed that they're actually a communications network. In contrast, um, last week, CERN and MIT released a thing called Proton VPN, which is their own VPN service, which has a free version which you can stay away from, get the paid one because it's faster. But they actually route all their traffic, they encrypt all the traffic and they route it through Switzerland, because Switzerland is a privacy friendly country, before it goes out anywhere else to ensure that no one can snoop on the data. Um, you need to look at the fine print when you're choosing VPN software to find out do they store your data? How are they encrypting it? Are they holding a decryption key? Because there's no point encrypting everything if someone else has got the keys. It's like locking your front door and handing your front keys to the world. You know, you've got to make sure of this stuff. So you've got to ask a few of those kinds of questions. Um, I think they're important questions to ask. I've played with several recently. So I've got Wangle, NordVPN, Symantec Wi-Fi protection, I think they call Wi-Fi privacy, which is the Norton pro And that's actually really good. The beauty of that is that the Norton one will auto-detect where you are and connect you to the fastest access point they can get you to and keep you secure. Most of the others make you choose where you are. So if you go to NordVPN, you've got to tell it you're in Australia. Although it's also very handy because you can tell it you're in America and then you get the American Netflix through your device um, and that kind of stuff. So you can also use VPNs to obfuscate your location as well as make your communications private. Um, and the extension of that outside of Wi-Fi is use communication services that are encrypted from end to end. So iMessage is good, WhatsApp is good, um, 
I think Facebook Messenger is encrypted end to end. Um, I'd stay away from anything that doesn't talk about being encrypted from end to end. Because you just you don't know who's going to listen in. And the other thing is, I don't trust my government anymore. I don't want them getting stuff. Well, apart from the fact that I actually don't think they're competent enough to know what to do with it when they get it. Um, and that's a fight that I've had with law enforcement people across, you know, across bar tables at different times. Because um, law enforcement always wants more data. Um, the problem is they don't actually know what to do with it when they've got it. Um, but they always want more. I've never heard a law enforcement person say, no, we've, we're okay, we don't need any more stuff. Um, backups. How many of you use Time Machine? How many of you use something else? How many of you don't back up your stuff? Good. How many of you follow the 3-2-1 rule? Okay, 3-2-1. Three, three copies of your critical data. Two different storage media. At least one of those copies off-site away from your main data. Yeah. Got to do it. And if you're really pedantic, you do 3 2 one zero, and the zero is you check it for errors. Zero errors. Okay? You must back up. If, you, if one day the worst happens and one of you gets smashed with a ransomware attack or someone take, steals your computer, because stealing your computer is a, a form of computer crime, or a hardware, you know, hard drive crashes or whatever, a backup makes your problems go away. Most people only learn about backups one way, and that's the hard way. Most people only learn to be pedantic about their backups after they've lost something. My backup got stolen. But you still had your main data, so there's your two yeah. copies, and then you got your another one. Yeah. Actually, what's interesting is some of the forms of ransomware that are, are around now, before they attack your computer, will go and look for backups and encrypt the backups first and then hit your computer. So it's important that your backups are air-gapped, <coughs> separate from your main system. So if you've got a time machine, for example, you should rotate. I would recommend rotating two drives for Time Machine if you're going to use Time Machine, and each day swap, so that if something goes really bad, one of them is disconnected from the rest of your computer, from your main computer, so that if your computer gets hit with a, a, a power surge or whatever, or a ransomware attack, if one ever come, one ever really punches through the Mac world, then at least your other one is is separate and not going to be hit. But air gap them as well. So that's where the loca separate locations are useful. Um, and last thing, knowledge is power. Huh? The one thing that we are really good at knowing about is what the bad guys are up to. We're really good at knowing ransomware is out there. It hits the news reasonably frequently now. If you, re if you read, if you spend five minutes looking at the IT press every week, you'll know what the big issues are because they, they, get, they get rounded up pretty quickly. Um, people that work in corporate IT or run their own businesses need to make sure that they know what's going on in terms of the, the cyber threat landscape. Um, when I speak to the government guys that are involved in the cyber security strategy, the one group that they say they have the hardest time getting through to is small business, small to medium businesses. It's a <coughs> real struggle for small to medium businesses to hear about this stuff and to know what to do. Um, and I think that's mainly because I know it's like for me, I'm more interested in getting my job done mm -hmm. and making money than messing around with my computer. Um, so that's a challenge, but it, you've still got to do all those other things like patch, update mm -hmm. your software, you know, keep your software up to date, use Wi-Fi safely. I still think Mac users should be using endpoint protection software on their computer. Not antivirus, <coughs> protection. It's not antivirus. It's software that detects when weird stuff's happening. It detects when you go to a link that's a bad link. That detects when you're opening an attachment that does something it shouldn't do. It's not just viruses, it's anomalous behaviour detection. That's what this software does now. And when it sees something goofy happening that's unexpected, it says, hey, did you mean that? Or, I'm stopping you. you is that Cyphos? It's all the traditional antivirus members. It's the Cyphos and Norton and all those guys. Cause first, You've got to get your head, it's not viruses, it's, it's actually monitoring your behaviour and the activity that's going on on your computer. So it's end, I don't like using the word antivirus because I think that's too limiting. It's endpoint protection software. And I think when you get to that, it's the endpoint, the device you're using, 
protecting that. So it's just you know a different way, it's different words for what we used to call antivirus. But I think it's 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 much broader than just viruses. It's looking at bad links and all sorts of other stuff as well. One of the things that businesses often don't know is what they've got. They, I was talking to some businesses about, you know, and I was saying to them, do you guys know where all your important data is? And most of them say, oh yeah, it's the documents folder or whatever it is, or it's this bunch of stuff on my computer, or whatever it is. And I sit there and go, what about your email? Is that important? What about your address book? How many people... I would die if I lost my address book. I've got like 10 years of contacts inside my address book with notes and all sorts of stuff. Like, that's critical business data to me. And yet, for a lot of businesses, they kind of think the list in the general ledger is the, the important list. It's not the list in the sales rep's phone. So it's knowing where all your important data is and then working out how you're going to protect each piece of it. A lot of businesses aren't very good at doing that. So it's taking that whole look at everything. It's knowledge of everything you've got that's critical. Um, so documents, mail, calendar. When I worked, um, when I worked at uh, at Nemco, AMO, where we had the meetings years and years ago, we had a we had an incident very early on. There, it wasn't a security incident. We actually had a, a hard drive failure, um, but it may as well have been a cyber incident for the effect that it had on us. Um, Again, it was a result of a cascade of stupidity, but we had a hard drive that failed and a red light came up and someone said, oh, that's okay, it's a redundant drive, the rest of it will be fine. So they let it go for a few days and then the second drive failed, which meant the whole thing stopped working. And we said, oh, that's okay, we can go and get another drive and we'll go to the backups, but nobody had noticed that the backups hadn't worked for 12 days. Right? We had a 12-day emptiness. You know what happens to your CEO's calendar in 12 days? A lot changes in your CEO's calendar in 12 days. That was the single biggest impact that the business had, was the CEO didn't know if he could walk out of his office or not for 12 days, because he didn't know who was going to show up for a meeting that he didn't have in his calendar, because there was a 12-day window where we didn't restore his calendar from a back, couldn't restore his calendar from a backup. You've got to know where the crown jewels are, and you've got to protect them and put the right measures around the jewels. Okay. Any other questions? Bless you. Um, two, two things. Uh, I've worked with a lot of the ladies in the 90s, and that's the only because I'm not in the uh, She said, I want to put an axe through my computer, but it's too hard to do that. Would you do a secure delete and then chuck it in the bin? So beautiful old 35 looks great. Yeah. So look, the screen is full of bloody icons. Yeah. Nothing's in folders. Yeah. I said, what's the password? She said, oh, I think it's my name. Password with uh, <coughs> return key. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah. And I went through every document and put it in a folder to make sure it was just a document. I couldn't find the... the um, but the fact that the thing was still working was pretty good value. I mean, it was just... Uh, <laughs> just like five. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we had a recent, probably a year or two ago, people were getting USB keys in their, in their mailbox. Yep. With the advertising. Yep. Thing. Don't touch them. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, and that's a common one. I thought it was great. I, there was, it was really interesting. I was talking to some, some penetration testers who were bad guys turned to the, you know, turned to the light side. Um, and one of the common things that they do when they're, doing recon when they're being asked to penetration test a company, they'll often do reconnaissance on executives and board members. And on, with one in particular, they worked out that he had a pattern of taking his dog out for a run three days a week at a particular time along a very specific route. And after observing this for a couple of weeks and working out exactly what was going to go on, they dropped the USB stick along the way just to see if he was dumb enough. Turns out he was. Um, <coughs> people do this stuff because it's like, oh, it's free. You know? Um, at the OzCert conference... I think it was four or five years ago, which is one of the big IT, one of the big security conferences in Australia. One of the vendors gave USB sticks out to everybody, and they were infected by accident. Um, a friend of mine who is a is a technology writer, and he was reviewing a photo, digital photo frame, um, that came from a an Australian retailer, and the photo frames came out of the factory infected with malware from China. 
I trust nothing. What about those pesky speed cameras? Haha, <laughs> isn't that fun? <laughs> um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and look, that was that that infection was caused by someone sticking a USB stick into a device. Is that just an excuse because they don't know what's going on? No, I think, um, you know, what, what, what's that saying? Is that never suspect a conspiracy when stupidity will account for it or something yeah. like that? Well, it's all about ransomware. It is. It was. Yeah, but, but once these things are out there, you know, this is the thing. Like, something like WannaCry was a big deal. It was a big deal to people who hadn't patched their systems. Like, and one of my friends said, well, Microsoft had no choice but to go and fix, um, fix Windows XP to deal with this problem. Windows XP has been off the market and out of support for six years or something now. If I'd been Microsoft, I'm, you know, and I'm not, I'm, you know, sadly, because I wouldn't no, mind it, a couple of billion spare down the back, back of the couch or something, but um, the problem is that people were running software that was six or seven years out of support, unpatched, connected to the internet, in a completely open environment with a flaw that had been reported three months before and fixed. Uh, you know, the, the, well, I've said this before, I've said it, I think I've seen it in this room, is, you know, you can make stuff as idiot proof as you like, but the world keeps on bringing bigger and better idiots out for you. And, you know, that was what the problem was there. <laughs> yeah, XP, and it was XP, Vista, Windows 8 and Windows 8.1 were all, all vulnerable to this particular flaw. And in fact, the really interesting part of that isn't that were those were the computer systems that were infectable or attackable. The really interesting thing is that it was a network protocol that was the vulnerable part. It was a thing called SMB, which is basically the, the, the network protocol that lets you share files across Windows networks. Take that one. Take um, Heartbleed, which was a, a, a 15 year old vulnerability inside the SSL and TLS libraries that are used for um, secure communications. There was another one six months after um, Heartbleed, which was actually worse, but didn't have a marketing department attached to it, so people didn't hear about it, um, which was similarly a 10-year-old flaw. There was another one last year, I'm trying to remember which one it was, because they, now they just give them, C, they're all CVEs, um, cr uh, critical vulnerability, whatever it is, they're listed in the database. That was just as severe, and again, didn't have a really great marketing machine attached to it, so no one really heard about it. These weren't flaws on Windows or Mac. These were flaws on protocols that all computer systems depend on. So you're not talking about 100 million Mac users. You're talking about 500 million separate computers that all yeah. use, whether they're Windows, Mac or Linux, all use the same building blocks. So what's actually happening is the bad guys are attacking the building blocks or finding vulnerabilities in the building blocks that have been that have exist, existed for years and years and years that no one's picked up on before. It's it's a I, that's the part that actually worries me. Is it, to me, it's a bit like worrying about someone smashing the window when the reality is that it's actually the foundations that are crumbling. So sorry, you were going to ask something, Noel. Yeah, well, just it fits in with some of that, and that is um, you were going to make a comment on ransomware for the Mac. Yeah, it does exist. Um, I don't, I don't understand why it hasn't picked up in a big way, but my suspicion is. Because when you execute a new program on a Mac, you always get that warning now that says this is not a signed application and it pops up by default and stops you from doing silly things. So I think that's one of the things that helps along the way. But there are people that just say yes to everything that pops up on their screen and hit the OK button. So there are people that have been hit with it. But doesn't the Mac always ask you for a proper login? Yeah, but you know, some people have enter as their login and other people do really goofy things like say, Oh, that looks like an official message. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. You know, people do do this stuff. And it does happen, but it doesn't happen as easily. Windows is better at it, because like whenever I try to install anything on my Windows systems now, it pops up and says, this computer program is trying to make a change to your system. Do you want it to? And the default button that's selected if you hit enter is no. It used to always be yes was the default. Now no is the default. Um, Sometimes the two little buttons are swapped around. Yeah, it's pretty cheeky. Um, but yeah, I think that's, by and large, I think the Mac is built more securely from the beginning because it's, it's, it's got a different underpinning to the Windows systems. But Windows is much better than it was. And I think what's happening is that slowly but surely the playing field with the software is, is evening out 
and it comes down to getting the user to do stuff. And they're getting Mac users to do stuff now. They're able to engineer people and hack the humans to do the stuff. My other question. Can I, can I share around? I'll come yeah. back. Yeah. No, 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 I'm, I'm, it's different. So you can go to somebody else. Yeah. So I'll rotate. Is it still apply with the Mac systems too? Like I've held back from going to the latest system because I'll lose valuable software in the past. Oh, I may upgrade and suffer along the way all the time. I, I think I think holding on to legacy. I get that there's software that people depend on to do stuff. I get it. There are ways around that now. So an example might be, I would suggest that if you've got a particular piece of software that depends on a very specific version of Mac OS, then I think you need to invest in something like Parallels so that you can run it virtual, run your old one virtualized and upgrade the rest of your system around it. So do you understand how that works? Not really. All right. No. Not really <laughs> Marker. I won't be able to see you, but... Uh, that's all right. So that's your Mac. Yeah. Okay. And that's running version, let's call it 10.2. Yeah. All right. And that's where your main so where you're running all your stuff. What you can do is you can get a piece of software called Parallels. And there's a couple of other ones, but it's virtualization software. And what it does is it creates a Mac inside your Mac. So it creates like a virtual Mac inside your Mac. And what you do is you run 10.2 here, mm. and you can upgrade this one to 10.3. And then you can run whatever you want in here. And what you can also then do is say, this has no network. So then it doesn't talk to the internet and it doesn't potentially get compromised. So that's a way around it. Um, I, the, the problem with old software is that eventually it stops being supported. So I, I there's an app that I used to really love called Bento, mm. made by the FileMaker people. You know what, it was a simple, easy problem solving application for me. Solved a couple of very specific things that I needed to do and it was great. It lasted about four years and the file maker people pulled the rug out from under me. I, I ummed and art about persisting with it and it was great because I could have it on my Mac and on my um, iPad and my iPhone. I could have the same data and all that kind of stuff. It all worked beautifully. When they called it, I said, you know what, I, I have to move away because at some point it's just going to stop working. And it, that's what happened, is eventually things that I depended on within it stopped working as they upgraded iOS and Mac OS. And then it just became kind of useless to me. So I think you eventually have to move forward. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And I know that people in this room that probably disagree with that view, but I think, I think there's, my problem is that I spend a lot of time with security people, so I get spooked by it. It's like, you know, everyone's a criminal if you're a copper. Everyone's a potential criminal if you're a copper. I look at the world and I go, it's full of threats. I stay as up to date as I can to avoid them all because I only ever hear the bad stories because um, that's, that's the environment I'm surrounded in. Um, but I would, I would go with, if you need to keep something old, I would go with virtualization to do that. Uh, the, uh, there's a recent uh, announcement that uh, the, the uh, major uh, GOA was getting together to, uh, to, uh, to work on the... Uh, Social media people sort of uh, to break into encryption systems. Oh, yeah. And there's sort of a, I think the Germany, the US, Australia, and, and, and uh, I think the federal government also want to go into Facebook. The federal government, the Australian federal government actually announced two days ago that they would be leading this effort yeah, um, at a meeting in Ottawa that's yeah. on at the moment. Yeah. So that was George Brandis yeah. and um, Peter Dutton. Oh, yeah. The, the co-ministers for Charisma, I think they are. No, that's the problem. Um, yeah. I, um, putting aside the political side of this, which is very obvious. Um, I mean, yeah, sorry. Don't even get me started on those two because we've had words. Um, but I... Here's the thing about encryption. We all depend on it. You don't have encryption, you don't have banking. It's that simple. Right? Just let's just put it out there. If you can't encrypt, you can't secure banking. Right? The government seems to think that if you create a mechanism for them to access secured communications, that no one else will get it. Now, early this year, WikiLeaks released a whole bunch of stuff called Bolt 7. Right, which is another bunch of stuff. Now, Vault 7 
amongst all the beautiful things that it in included were how the CIA, CIA has been stockpiling system vulnerabilities to use against its enemies. Right? Which is fine. Bad, good guys have always collected weapons to use against bad guys. That's the nature of the world. I don't like it. I'd like to live in, Star Trek, in the Star Trek universe where all the humans get along nicely, but we're not there. The problem is that that stuff got leaked and then the bad guys got it. And then we got WannaCry because WannaCry used the, the vulnerabilities that were, came at, that were made available through the Vault 7 leak. Right? Governments are useless at securing stuff. You know this because at the moment I hear Malcolm Turnbull saying that there are no rifts inside the Liberal Party, <laughs> which is almost always code for there are rifts inside the Liberal Party. Yeah. And it's the same with the Labor Party. Whenever the, whenever the leader of a political party says there are no problems, you know to start going to Tabcor and betting on who the next Prime Minister or leader of the opposition is going to be. So bad, the governments are useless at hiding this stuff. Eventually it always comes out. Might take a year, might take three. They'll lose it. So backdoors into encryption, bad. Um, I don't understand why they need them because, for example, I spoke to a guy last year, Peter Goodman, who's from the University of Canterbury. He's one of the architects of PGP, which is a pretty good privacy. So Peter's a pretty smart guy, speaks at a million miles an hour. Right? You actually got to slow the recordings down when I talk after an interview with him. He pointed out a whole bunch of the biggest hacks that have happened over the last decade. All of them involved accessing encrypted data. All of them involved bypassing the encryption. How do you bypass encryption? You attack the endpoint. You trick the user. You trick the user. You get onto the computer. Or if it's encrypted firmware, you find where the, where the humans have made an error so that there's unencrypted access to the data. Because every piece of data, as well secured and encrypted it is from, from story, from, you know, when it, whether it's in flight, which during transmission, or when it's at rest in storage, at some point someone has to read it. A human needs to access that data, and at that split second, it's unencrypted. The, the target hack was a piece of malicious software that was on point of sale terminals at, at, at target stores in the United States. The data that it stole was unencrypted for milliseconds. Milliseconds. At some point, the data is always unencrypted. And that's when they go and get it. So you can have all the encryption in the world, you just get it when it's unencrypted or you access the end user device. So I don't get why the government feels like it needs access to... To me, they're just being lazy. Because it's clear. Well, A, it's because it's... But I think it's just lazy because it's probably easier for them to go and attack your phone than it is to go and attack the, the bit stream floating through the sky. I think, I think the courts... We might have the court be able to get somebody to decrypt criminals' messages. Mm. They will, but they can't because... If, and this is the, the San Bernardino case last, from last February in the United States. So the, Fed, the FBI was trying to compel yeah. Apple yeah. to decrypt the device in order to be able to access... There's a whole bunch of reasons why that was a really stupid thing to even ask because there were six devices that the police had. All of them had been destroyed except this one. The bad guys had actually destroyed every other computer they owned except for this one device, which was the one that was owned by the San Bernardino... Um, um, council or whatever it was called and what was interesting was they actually had the means to decrypt the, the, the device and had paid software licences for control of that device but neglected to install the control system for that device. So they were paying 115 bucks a year for the licence for the mobile device management software which they never got to into installing. So they could have actually done it if they'd done their jobs properly but that's by the by. They, the FBI wanted access to that device. Apple said we can't do it. The government said, well, you have to do it, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, we'd love to, but we don't actually have the decryption key. You can't decrypt a device without the key. Well, you can, but you've got to last about 300 years and you've got to have a whole bunch of computing power behind you to do it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an impossibility, but it's a practical impossibility. So that's what the government would like companies like Apple and um, Facebook Ooh. to do and so, so forth. When they say they've got a third party to break into it, they were bluffing. No, they, they paid a bunch of bad guys for a vulnerability that was previously undisclosed. So this is 
There are, there are vulnerabilities in all the software that's out there in the world. The iPhone, I will guarantee you, has undisclosed vulnerabilities that bad guys are holding on to for a rainy day, for when they know that they're going to be able to exploit it. OS X, Mac OS is the same. Windows is the same. Your D-Link router at home is the same. There's undisclosed vulnerabilities for all these things out there. Bad guys have got them. They're waiting for the moment to be able to use them when they're going to have maximum effect and get a mixture. And remember, follow the money. When they're going to make the most money out of it, that's when they're going to do it. So that's what they did. In fact, that device, what was interesting was it was an iPhone 5C and it was actually relatively easy to do. Um, the government was just a bit stupid in that case because all they actually had to do was crack the device open, take the storage out of it, um, clone the storage a, a whole bunch of times and then basically just apply four digit pin codes until you hit the right, until you decrypted one of the copies. So they could have actually done it but then they just paid, I think they paid some bad guys, it was something like a million dollars US. They paid a million bucks US to put some bad guys to be able to get it. And get, oh, by the way, did anyone know what was on that what was on that device that was so valuable? It was nothing. It was nothing. Well, on the open face, the radicalised uh, youth you know, use WhatsApp and use uh, Messenger. I think the more the point is, if you say, it's the intervention earlier in the course of the you don't want to get me started on oh, radicalisation and terrorism. Um, well, I'll get you on. I've for a very long time. One of the things I was wondering is, like, we all get fished all the time. Mm. So why isn't the hit rate amazingly large? I mean, it's so easy, you know, you might get fished 20 times in a week and you hit one and you think, oh, I should have. But why, why aren't we... Why aren't because we it's a numbers game. So remember on my chart... So we could be hit, but we're just not big enough, or... Something. No. What? What? what um, status? Remember on my chart, I said fishing, high still, low focus? Yeah. All right. Base end, because to get to create a phishing message that will get you to click actually takes a bit of sophistication and expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to, firstly, you've got to be able to spell and, and, and be able to write with English grammar if you're going to attack English-speaking countries. So the, the phishing attacks that were badly spelled mm. and you know had poor grammar and bad logos and all that, they're gone, right? That stuff's rubbish. That that was three years ago. The bad guys are smart now. They actually there was a really good one about two weeks ago in New South Wales that was um, that used the <coughs> um, I'm trying to remember what, what the actual state authority is, but it's the Maritime and something or other state authority in New South Wales. And it was actually a really, really good fish. The email was very well crafted. And the only thing that gave it away was the logo was not as high resolution as the official logo mm. that they use on their emails. But otherwise, it was very, very close. Mm. But high skill to get it right. And they literally, because they go and they go to the market, the marketplace, and they go and rent a bot <coughs> of 100,000 machines to go and each send 1,000 emails for them. So there's your 10 million emails go out. They send 10 million emails go out. And as long as five click, they're happy. They get through five people who follow the bouncing ball all the way through to the Nigerian <coughs> prince, they win. That's enough money. Remember, that's pop that whole attack's probably only cost them 500 US dollars. But I'm surprised it's like far over I'd imagine there'd be a lot, lot more. Uh, it it like depends that. on which part of it. In Queensland, they have a much better hit rate than they do in Victoria, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's the statistics oh, are there. Yeah. That's not, that's not, that, that, that's just data, okay? I don't, I don't put data out there with judgment. It's just data. <laughs> There, was, there wasn't much judgment. <laughs> but they do. The, the bad guys, they'll, they'll target particular groups. And in fact, they often will target older people who will see so many emails and they'll go, oh, one of them must have been right. And they'll play. They'll do that. And that's why the phone scams work. Um, because they play on people. They, they'll, trip, they'll typically go to older people who are less likely to have a high level of computer knowledge and play them. Um, and that's why when someone says something on the phone... This is the old, the old game. Uh, I'm look, from Windows Support. Yes, can you look inside? I'll take you through the service. Did you see that file? Ah, I told you there was something in there. The <laughs> standard Windows file you need to operate. Yeah. And they say, oh, it's there. Yeah, yeah, you play that game. Sometimes I just keep them on the phone for fun because I'm bored, you know. Yeah. But, um, when they say, click the certain key, you say, oh, it's not on my keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> they typically say, I don't have one of those keys, where is it? Yeah. And he keeps it up. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think one of my friends, one of my friends, used to try to keep my. He used to actually set a timer to see how long you keep going for, 
I think he, he got a couple of mats over 40 minutes on the phone. Because if he can if he can get him on the phone and he knows what he's doing, he's not going to get caught. Mm. It probably saves another 10 people later on because he's kept them busy. Um, but yeah, that, this is the thing. I, I always I find this really this is quite instructional to me because when you think about what they're looking for, the low focus guys are playing on big numbers, right? They're, they're going. These are the guys are saying if we send 10 million of these and three work, we'll make money. That's, that's how they play it. Now remember, this is it's, cyber crime is now primarily about money. Rather it's, than being malicious. Rather than being malicious. Uh, it, taking aside nation state attacks. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's about trying to make money. Because it's much easier to get you to click on an email than it is to sell you cocaine. People don't know who I am because my email address is Brian Rule because I'm an experienced person. Mm. I get these emails, dear Mr B. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, look, I get, I get also. The, the problem for me is that I get people from Asia who send me stuff that's actually really stuff, um, but their grammar is not great, or they're, you know, they'll, they'll have like dear Mr Anthony and stuff like that, which is okay because I and often I go okay, I, I understand where they're coming from because it's a, it's a, that's a cultural linguistic <laughs> difference, but it's um, it keeps you on your toes. It's actually kind of good because it keeps you on your toes because you go, oh, hang on a sec, I've got to think about that one. Um, but I've nearly been fished. It's happened to me. Yeah. Anthony, um, could you make a comment on the recent announcement that the Australian government is going to pay two to three hundred million dollars to get secure, so-called secure data off its existing arrangement because the company that was doing it has now acquired a, uh, been taken over in part by the Chinese government. Oh. Oh, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of it, but there's. If you look at it from a, um, there's interesting um, legal and legislative stuff that goes around with, around the, the question of where you store particular data in this country. Um, Australia, when the NBN project started, uh, Huawei, who is a Chinese network equipment manufacturer and also makes smartphones and other stuff, but they, they're, they're big businesses around making um, high end network equipment, they were effectively banned from being engaged by the NBN Co into prov for providing infrastructure. Um, I don't know the specifics of what you're talking about, but I think it's yet another indication of our very interesting relationship with China. But it's going to take two years to do it. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. But now, military start to use the same company's telephones. Yeah. yeah, but look, the reality is, like, if we, if China wanted to grab stuff from us, they've already got it. Like, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, and I, I mean, that's not a flippant comment. The reality is that we've had data available on servers for years and years and years and years and years. If China wanted it, they've got it. Um, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's there's a whole lot of corporate crown jewels left in the government's in you know in the government's um, Tower of London so to speak that the Chinese haven't been able to take if they've wanted them. Um, Why do most people use the public internet for government? Why don't they have a separate internet, separate network? Mm. Uh, don't. Oh, that's a different question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Charmin. The other thing that worries me is that um, as software moves through its um, Lifespan, you know. So, say, look at Facebook now; it's very popular. It's current and everything. Uh, but in five years' time, it might become less current. Mm. So then, the original owners sell that software on to somebody else, mm. and so you can actually, and they can be sold internationally. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. all that data where they, you know, they've asked for. Con access to your contacts with all the emails and things like that. And, um, that gets passed on yeah, to rogue organisations. Oh, and potentially. I've already seen, seen that probably with some of the um, things that were popular in the 2000 years, things like Friends Reunited in the UK. Yeah, well, I mean, that, the Friends Reunited and the School Friends and all those kinds of guys, they actually got acquired. Uh, I think School Friends got acquired by Facebook. Sorry. I think some of those actually got bought by Facebook. I think they actually are owned there. Mm -hmm. What's interesting when you, you talk about them, who's, who's going to buy them? Yeah. Buy the data with it. Yeah. Look, a good example is LinkedIn. LinkedIn got bought a couple of years ago, so LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. 
Um, so that's that's interesting because the ownership of the data has moved over to LinkedIn to face to Microsoft. Microsoft bought Skype a few years before that, so that's a whole bunch of other stuff they've got. It, the, the, thing that's, the thing that happens though is that these companies are often publicly traded. So if you're talking about Microsoft buying them, then it might be a, quote unquote to use your word, a rogue organisation. But it's a publicly traded rogue organisation that's got a whole bunch of shareholders. And there are some larger shareholders and there are smaller shareholders. So that's kind of there. Um, when they move between privately owned companies, there are laws that protect this. So a good example of what's going on is um, does everyone, everyone knows Dropbox, mm -hmm. right? Does everyone, does everyone use Dropbox? Anyone? Oh, how many people yeah, use them? Yeah. On and off. Yeah, most people. Most people have probably got a Dropbox account hiding yeah. in there somewhere. All of your data for Dropbox goes into the United States. All of it. Yeah. Right? There are no Australian servers for Dropbox, and there are no plans to have Australian servers for Dropbox either. Yeah. Who owns what passport? Right. Well, yeah. yeah. So let's grab let's grab Dropbox as that as that example. European law dictates that the data of European citizens has to reside in the EU. So Dropbox has servers in Germany for EU citizen data because there's a strong legal, legal obligation to make that happen. If the Australian government was serious, they could make the same obligation um, and that could change so that at least Australian data, regardless of ownership, stays on shore. China is really interesting. China, data to do with a Chinese national must stay in China. Right? So if you're an Australian company and you have one Chinese customer, one, you have to have a server or a thing in China for that person's data. You can't put it here in Australia. Right? There are probably limits to how that works. But my understanding is that Chinese, the data belonging to Chinese nationals needs to be in China. So you've got things now like what's happening in the UK, in, sorry, the EU, can't say the UK for that anymore, the, in, the UK, in the EU next year, they've got a, a thing called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which has a whole bunch of very strict rules about what happens to the data belonging to EU citizens and the right for that data to be destroyed if the citizen asks for it. So it's about right to be forgotten knowing where it's stored, being able to change that data, to be able to use pseudonyms, a whole bunch of rules around it. If a company breaches that law and is found, the penalties are monstrous. They're huge. It's 4% of global revenue mm -hmm. if they breach that law. It's a big deal. Um, we're starting to get serious with that in Australia now with the data breach regulations that are coming out next uh, February the 18th next year. So everyone in this room, anyone in this room who holds, holds personal data belonging to someone else, regardless of the amount of revenue your business makes, regardless of anything else, will have a liability if that data is leaked and you don't reveal the leak. And there will be rules about what you have to do if you lose a piece of data and it gets breached, leak, gets leaked out, about how you have to notify the person whose data was lost, how you have to notify the privacy commissioner, and if you fail to do so, individuals can get fined $360,000. So if you leave your phone on a plane and the data and gets got, stolen and it's got client data on it, like your contacts here, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. even, even if you say, oh, it's got a four digit protection on it. Right. You have to report. If you report it, you're okay. Who do you report it to? The privacy commissioner. The office, I the lost OAIC. My, I, lost, I left my phone on a plane. I left my phone on a plane. And then if you say, but it's password protected and the data, because it's password protected, is encrypted, so the risk of harm to individuals' data you have is very minimal, you'll be okay. And if you say, I used my Find My Phone feature to wipe my phone... You'll be fine. So you can do stuff. So if you've got protective measures in place, you're okay. If so you do what catches... the backup disk, you could be with the problem if you didn't, if you didn't totally wipe it and you got rid of it. Well, because it could expose somebody's. Yeah, the, the thing is, you can. Two years or three years of backup. Uh, if you've got a backup of that data. Well, so, you know, say. So if Les loses his phone. Remove, say you remove somebody's information so that it's not vulnerable mm. anymore on your current device. 
You should be. Yeah. Backups would have it. Um, I'm. I would have to look into that about what you've got to do with that data. If you, but if under the European law, if someone says delete me from the from your database, you actually have to go back through your backups and delete them out of your backups as well. That that'll but be the EU possible. rule. Can you yes. No, I don't I'm care whether. I'm not, no, I'm not asking you whether it's possible or impossible. I'm telling you you have to do it. <laughs> That's what the law says. I don't so care about how easy or hard it is. The EU law is you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's impossible, no, because then you go and find a backup solution that lets you do it. But in certain professions, there are ethical responsibilities. Oh, that's different. Yeah. That each individual profession will say, regardless yeah. of what the Australian government says, our profession says you must let your patient client know that their data has been breached. Yes, and under the or Australian you, law, you'll yes. have to let them know. Yes. So what's interesting is. If, if there's always, I've been asked about this a number of times. I've got two examples I always put up as contrasting examples. So I'm one is. Here to give them yeah, I know, yeah, but I'm going to talk until I feel okay. like it, right? <laughs> so they've got no catch of the day online shopping site. Yes. So two years ago, catch of the day revealed that their customer database had been breached and customer names and credit card numbers had been breached and made available to bad guys. Right? After X number of months, as I recall. Took them two years to report. Yes. So it had happened four years ago, and then two years ago they reported it. And they only reported it because the press found out and were about to out them, so they thought we'd better get out there first. So I remember my chart before, eight months until you find out what someone else tells you. There we go. Bad, bad, bad. Slap on the wrist. Talked to their CEO about it the other day, and that's a conversation that's for another day, not in public. Is it go six months ago. Red Cross, Red Cross Blood Bank. Everyone remembers what happened? Red Cross Blood Bank donor data was found on a publicly accessible server. Included names, blood types, yada yada. Now I spoke to a guy last week who was the person that the breach was reported to. Right? The, the guy that found the data was actually literally randomly running through IP addresses, so network addresses, and he was literally going 123.123.123.000, and just checking ports until he found stuff. And he found backup, it was actually backups of the actual, of the real data that were put on a publicly accessible server by a third party contractor. Right? It was, in the grand scheme of it, it was it didn't turn out as badly as it could have because the only person that accessed this data was the guy who found it and the guy who reported it to. Okay, they reported it, went to the blood bank. Within 72 hours, the blood bank had notified all the people that were potentially affected by email and by text message where they could do that. They'd made public statements. They issued press releases. Their CEO stood in front of a TV camera and took the blame. Took the blame. It was a contractor's fault. It was a Western Australian IT services company who did the who actually caused the problem. And the CEO said, it's not good enough. We should do better. We are really sorry. We've let down our customers. We're sorry we let down our customers. But it was, a, it was the biggest mea culpa I've ever seen in corporate Australian life. Given that the blood bank relies on trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. She did the... She, and that CEO, she did exactly the right thing. In hey, contrast sorry. with someone else. Mm -hmm. And did blood donations drop? No. And in fact, what's interesting is that statistically, when you look at companies that have been breached, the companies that are breached and reveal it quickly tell people what happened, notify the affected parties, tell them why, how it happened and what they've done to stop it from happening again, come back better. They take a little dip and then they recover above where they were before because it actually builds trust because they go, you know what, we're human, we screwed up, but we fixed it and this is what we're doing to make it better. Isn't that go back in the 80s with Tylenol, the original, the original Tylenol sucker? Yes, when they were killing, that was the one where they were killing people, wasn't it? Well, people had put in nasties into the into the Tylenol, you know, the head yeah. head. and so they create, they went to a huge mea culpa on that, and mm. then they created new. They changed the packaging, packaging and everything. Packaging. Yeah, 
But and it works that way, you yeah. know, because this is the problem: is that it's like it's like blaming it's like blaming Ford if your car gets stolen, right? It doesn't make sense. They didn't steal the car, but if they come back and said, you know what, we could have actually made it, we could make the next lot of cars more secure and safer, and we do it. You know, they had the problem with the Pinto, the Ford Pinto. It was a wonderful car. If you gave it a love tap in the back, it exploded. Um, because they managed to get the petrol tank in the back of the car a little bit too close together when there was a rear impact. Um, they actually, they're a really interesting story on in what happens when you um, say, we know that this will explode this many times and will cost this many lives, but we know that the cost of a life is this much and it's cheaper for us to just let people die than to go and fix the problem. Yeah. They did maths. Yeah. They did it with maths. Yeah. I want to suggest... We should stop there. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I've been relying on a particular area. Um, writer from a guy called Bruce Schneier. Oh, Bruce is a great guy. If you want to know about cryptography, he's one of the original cryptographers, but he thinks a lot, very deeply about Mm. the human side of it. He wrote a paper called The Psychology of Security, even though he's a a cryptographer, and he said there are four issues we have to work on. We've solved the first three, which is all about algorithms and the language and all that sort of computer stuff. He said the fourth one is the neuroscience of fear. Mm. In other words, how do we get people to do things against their will without them even knowing that they're doing it? So he said the fourth part is the psychology of the end user. He wrote this in 2007. Mm. I kept relying on it and reviewing it and thinking it's a great piece of paper. I'm going to put it into my Dropbox account in my public folder. I'll send you a link tonight. You can down, go and download. Well, you can go to cso.com.au and read the interview I did with Bruce last year. Even better. 